welcome everyone. Always a pleasure to uh, welcome everyone to our seminar series, Topics in the Aesthetics of Music and Sound. This semester, the theme has been mostly metal, but we're taking a pause from that theme today, and we're going to um, hear a seminar given by uh, Jens Jakob Kier Hansen. I got them all right. Yes. Who uh, will be talking to us about uh, an issue which has been uh, very much in the news here in Denmark in the past half year or so uh, with regard to the um, government policies for funding orchestras. So we'll hear all about that in a minute. Uh, what we usually do in Tiago when we have uh, one of these seminars and it's uh, videotaped is we do a quick round of introductions and first I ask everybody, is it okay if your images and your audio appear on YouTube when we open the video? Oh, yes. Very good. So uh, everyone said yes. So uh, why don't we start with you, Johnny? Uh, yeah. Do my a selfie and... Uh, Introduce yourself. Hello. <laughs> My name is Johnny Harbo. I'm a master in comparative literature here from SDU. And I am a casual hang around of this research group. Well, more than that, you're also a very uh, capable, capable uh, videographer. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, uh, an expert in metal. Yes, we also have to do that. Beatles. Yes, hello. Hello, Jens Jakob. Um, so I'm Vitus Vestergaard and I'm an assistant professor here at the University of SDU um, at Media Studies and I'm very interested in both classical music and, uh, and media industries so uh, I'm really looking forward to this presentation. Vitus is also an expert in metal. What? Trans is the statistician. <laughs> it's nothing to do with gender. <laughs> Nevertheless, I'm interested in the relation between music Literature and Victorian art in particular. Always oh, um, great when you're here. It's great to be here, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, my name is Evelyn Schrader. I'm a uh, first year student at the MA in Middle East Studies program. And uh, I'm here because um, I think the presentation will be a very interesting one. The, Title, trust me, the good, and then you you often come to our seminars, and it's always good to have you here. So uh, my name is Cynthia Grund. I'm an associate professor of philosophy here at the University of Southern Denmark, in the Institute for the Study of Culture, and uh, I'm delighted to host this seminar series today. Uh, if you've been following our series, you'll notice that we're a somewhat smaller group. Denmark seems to be ravaged both by the flu and by good weather. So those two things. Uh, often contribute to uh, lower attendance at university functions. But since we're taping this to put it on YouTube, it doesn't really matter. So, uh, Jens Jakob, would you like to introduce yourself and uh, tell us something about your topic and then the floor is yours. Yes, well, I'm a student in journalism uh, studying fourth semester. Um, and then I have a bachelor degree as a classical pianist and I had the pleasure to play a concert in September. Wonderful concert. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about uh, something that has been um, very like controversial in um, this issue in Denmark's radio, especially with the people I know from the music environment, uh, and that is the closing down of the Danish entertainment orchestra. Um, yeah, so. Start, yes, you're very welcome, and I assume you have as part of your presentation a little orientation about why the Danish Entertainment Orchestra is uh, quite a large, quite a big symbol here in yeah. Denmark as well. So yes. that it's sort of a, an event that uh, is uh, it's larger than the sum of its parts, as it were. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, the Danish Entertainment Orchestra, also as the name says, is an orchestra that. Um, it's a symphonic orchestra that both has played the classical repertoire and also the popular music. That is also, for instance, Bohan uh, Gay, this Danish uh, pop singer, he played with the orchestra. And uh, it's, uh, it's kind of a rare phenomenon, actually, having um, a classical orchestra that has such a big span from the most popular music to the classical repertoire. Um, actually, um, the last 20 years that have been um, a development in the orchestra because they earlier they, they played classical music they as I said they had this big span but 
Uh, now, now they've actually got international rewards, and um, they had huge su uh, success playing Mozart and Beethoven in, uh, in the so-called, you know, uh, historically informed way, where they uh, play it like really differently than the big orchestras, or because they're a smaller group, they're only like uh, I don't know exactly how many, but about half as many as the big symphony orchestra of Denmark's radio. So uh, I mean, they've, they've, they've both been uh, brilliant in the and, and very sort of individual in the way of playing the classical repertoire, and at the same time, they've played the popular stuff, and that has really made them something uh, special. Uh, so for many people, also the, the closing down of the orchestra was a, a huge surprise because it was actually a very a big success. Um, yeah, and then my talk was about the uh, aesthetical perceptions and monetary prioritizations. Um, and what I did continue was that I um, analyzed 50 newspaper articles published between the 9th of S September when it was announced that the orchestra would be closed down and uh, um, 31st of December of 2014. Uh, and then I've also looked at the annual report from Denmark Radio to see, I mean, uh, how, how has the orchestra been doing and also the economy of Denmark Radio, how has it been. But um, as I revealed reveal later, I've decided to split this lecture into two, talk about the all the aesthetical things and the debate about that, but then also the politics. Because what was really prominent in the debate was, uh, was political discussions and the whole thing about closing down the orchestra really became a huge political, um, how can you say, um, it really be became a political struggle both for the politicians and Denmark's radio and that was really what, when I've been reading these 50 <laughs> uh, articles, what, what it was mostly about. Uh, yeah, so what I did was I, I read the articles and then I wrote down sort of the points in the articles. Uh, and I chose the articles from Infomedia and, and uh, chose, uh, I mean, there, there are lots of small debates, uh, how you call it, uh, like small comments in the newspaper, but, but I, s I chose the, the, the bigger ones and also, for instance, there was a musician from the Royal Danish Music Academy who also wrote a big uh, comment, but so I chose the articles from which, which people it had to have a certain length and then uh, the, the people had to have a certain, how can we say, authority. Um, right. And then I compared it and tried to see you know, patterns and stuff. And didn't you say, um, when we met uh, briefly before the talk a few days ago, you said um, that this was interesting enough that you were considering making a research project? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, I've thought about that too. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm actually, I've been working on that to the summer to make some research uh, about it. Also, especially um, focusing on, on the sort of blame aspect, because uh, the funny thing is that Denmark Radio, or many politicians were blaming either Denmark Radio or the Minister of Culture, and I think that could be very interesting like, to analyze how that has been. Uh, and unfortunately, I also think that, I'll get back to that later, what was what also uh, made this thing happen, that it was closed down, that it became like a power struggle, and then somebody had to act, you know, uh, not to, uh, how can I say, uh, give, give away for this political pressure. Um, so, yeah, the conclusion and the, the, the debate was uh, about aesthetics and music was diminutive. It was only, uh, I could only find like, 10 articles out of the 50 that was like critical and said that Denmark's radio should not, they should uh, have kept the orchestra and it was, uh, there was a, uh, people for instance who wrote that it was really a loss of culture to close down the orchestra. Um, but again, it was more about politics um, and the big boss for it was the arms link principle in Danish, uh, arms link principle, uh, translated. Um, I'll get back to that later, but I'll start with the debate there was about the aesthetics. Um, and if we start, uh, here we have, by the way, the um, Denmark's radio entertainment orchestra, classical concert, and then some popular concert. The same musicians, I believe, one of the violinists, uh, 
it's uh, wearing, wearing uh, sunglasses here. And it's, you know, it, says, it really says something how uh, that they can play everything, uh, basically, as uh, something special. Uh, but something that occurred in the debate was the dualism about classical music and popular music. In Denmark, we have this uh, thing about classic music, classical music, and then rhythmic music. It's called like rhythmical music. It's string thing, but it's more, I believe, more like the popular music. It's the same thing that rhythmical music is more for entertainment and, and not, yeah, something broader. Um, and as I said, the entertainment orchestra, that's like entertainment orchestra, they're not radio. Uh, they, they did both. Um, but in the end, that was also what was used against them. Also, when uh, when uh, Denmark Radio uh, said in the media that they wanted to shut it down, uh, now there'll be a lot of text. <laughs> the next one. Yeah. Well, I read anyway because I think it's really interesting and important. Um, the chairman of the board of Denmark Radio said that uh, we wish to restructure the music service of Denmark Radio so the public also in the future has the opportunity to experience live music of the highest quality by the ensembles of Denmark Radio, also outside the concert house of Denmark Radio. I apologize for spelling mistakes, if that's okay, it's a bit fast, okay. The plan implies a strengthening artistically and in terms of resources of the symphonic orchestra of Denmark Radio, the girls choir uh, of Denmark Radio and the big band of Denmark Radio, while the entertainment orchestra of Denmark Radio will be closed from 1st of January 2015. It is regrettable that the car preserved entertainment orchestra which have achieved international class, but we have to, also with regards to the ensembles, to strengthen the profile like on the other areas of Denmark Radio. With the restructure uh, of the ensembles of Denmark Radio will each have a um, the ensembles of Denmark Radio will each have a clearer profile profile and will be able to lift their current artistic level even more. At the same time, the plan contains an invitation to the other operators of Denmark to cooperate. So the argument is that uh, sort of they, are, they have not been uh, it, it weakens the orchestra that they, they, they were able to play too much uh, too broad a repertory. Uh, so as, as I also say afterwards, it's um, it seems to build on this idea, this very sort of conservative view on. And classical music, actually, that it should be of you know, the traditional way, and also uh, the Denmark, um, the symphonic orchestra of Denmark Radio is also much more traditional. They play the like uh, mostly music of the Romantic era, and and they have this concert with the uh, symphony, and then there's uh, a concerto, and it's very traditional. Um, so that seems like to be the, as I see it. Um, the idea about this argument that they um, they weakened themselves it was in a way their own fault that's also what I see um, and what I'll show afterwards in the media there was I found two articles that actually said the same way they like just uh, how can you say took the press release and then repeated it <laughs> well that is the uh, director for DR culture um, Closing down the entertainment orchestra is a big step to take. The entertainment orchestra has existed since 75 years and has played an important role in the Danish music environment, amongst others in connection to many big popular events during the years, and for many of the musicians it will be a farewell to a long life as a musician in the entertainment orchestra. But the use of medias and cultural services in the public is changing rapidly these years, and therefore we have to make sure that Denmark Radio has the resources to invest in new quality content and new ways of distributing which reaches the viewers and listeners where they are also in the future. So again it's like about the future um, and at the same time we believe that with the restructuring of the ensembles can create overall services of live music of Denmark Radio which both ensures the artistic developments and makes the orchestras more flexible so they can reach out further in the country. The music plan also especially focuses on families, children and young people and thereby bases itself on current successful work with concerts for children for Denmark Radio. So this is also about um, that they have to like follow the development they gave it and have to be there where their viewers are also as a public service um, institution. Um, I mean that's often something you can hear as argument that they, they have to give people what they want in a way. Um, but I think it's, it's still interesting and it's not, I mean, it's not so clearly communicated, I mean, that they say that 
is changing rapidly and they have to make sure that they have resources. I mean, they don't say that there are less people listening to classical music or something like that. I mean, that would be a strong argument, but maybe that's also not the case. I mean, that's how really later. They actually had uh, quite a uh, big success with the arrangement that they make in the uh, uh, the concert house of Denver really with the concerts. Also, the revenue has been growing. At least what I could find. I don't have the new. I don't have the new uh, annual report from 2014. Uh, but as I show later, from 2009 to 2013, it was actually going pretty well. Um, but but yeah, well. Then I found some article also that sort of copied them. I not the last one. I'll not speak about it. But I mean, it doesn't copy so much new things. Um, it's this, the same thing with that. It will stress, uh, strengthen their profile and give opportunities to the other orchestras to grow. Uh, but the thing is that this orchestra is 75 years old, and uh, what they've achieved. Personally, I don't believe that you can just achieve that by, by doing this. And if it's something that really takes time and you build a tradition and as a musician it really takes time to grow these um, this skills to be able to play so much different repertoire. Um, well anyway, there were two articles that sort of uh, copied the, the press releases um, I found. One from uh, 4th December, Johans Posten, and uh, then one 12th December and extra blood, that's like the tablet media. Um, well, they, they um, in uh, the US Boston, uh, Carson Fisher claimed that there has not been enough prestige about the entertainment orchestra. And they have like caused their own, uh, it was like, uh, how do you say it? They have created the problem themselves by playing also the classical repertoire. Uh, and then they, uh, that they, the, the repertory in classical music has become um, more narrow and it's mainly today concentrating on the symphonic, um, symphonic um, yeah, music. So it's this idea again about that classical music is something like conservative and today it's getting more sort of narrow and, and uh, not, not this idea about that, that maybe you can also get new audience by trying to experiment more or something uh, similar. Um, yes, and then what's especially interesting, I think, is that um, the entertainment orchestra was established as a counterpart to the symphonic orchestra. Um, but then he claims that the taste of music has changed, but the, the, um, the orchestra hasn't. And um, I think that's pretty interesting because, I mean, it's especially these uh, 10, 20 last year when they got Adam Fischer, this um, mm -hmm. Hungarian conductor, um, that they really started also to be able to play to play classical music on a really high level in, in, in a historically in, informed way, as it's called, and got many, yeah, a lot of international attention. So I think you could also see that they they have had this tradition for playing the popular. Music and having um, and um, experiment, experimenting more, but then they, the, then they even also um, the last years. Then they, it is not because they've lost something, lost that, and now they're only playing classical music. They've just, I mean, grown even more, and now they're even able to master <laughs> the whole spectrum. Um, and then, okay, uh, there, there was another one uh, which said that. Uh, that it was just unnecessary with this orchestra, and uh, and then also again that the politicians should should stay um, out of how um, how Denmark's radio and how they are like deciding what how to spend their money. Um, right. So if we look at like, the arguments of Denmark Radio, it will strengthen the profile of the other orchestras of Denmark Radio and. The habits of the media users are changing and we have to adapt. And uh, did the public buy the idea about they undermine themselves? I mean, some did, as I said, these, these two articles. Um, so they, they had some success with their, um, with their communication, they I'd say. But um, as I was 
as later I'll, I'll talk about the, the politics that was really what what uh, got the attention in the media. Um, yeah, I've actually already said that, but now they, they use like a conservative view of classical music, like it has to be, like this is traditional repertory and yeah, you, you can't have two orchestras playing classical music even though the, the other one is a completely not, not only what they are able to do, but also their artistic profile. I mean, if you listen to, uh, I could have brought that today, uh, but, but if there's a recording on YouTube with Denmark's Radio's Entertainment Orchestra playing Beethoven's Third Symphony and then the Symphonic Orchestra. And it's really interesting to hear the difference because it's, it's really completely other world. And with the smaller orchestra, they play a lot faster, but also more, uh, I'd say, um, just very different sound, much more raw, and, uh, and just, uh, it's in a way a bit more sort of chaotic <laughs> in its expression. Whereas the Denmark Symphonic Orchestra is really like, very like, polished and also perfectionist in another way, which is also really, really nice, but I mean, when I just heard these two recordings, for me it really proved that there's just such a huge difference and it's a big loss, like, so to lose the other one, uh, the Danish um, Entertainment Orchestra, I mean, there's this style and way of playing, it's, it's actually also very, very modern and something that's really growing classical music, these uh, historically informed ways of playing. Um, so, uh, but if we look at the economical arguments, I looked at the annual reports from 2010, and you can see, uh, if we look at the, well, what they earned from, um, from orchestra, uh, yeah, publicum, <coughs> It's uh, audience and orchestra revenues. It grew uh, from 2009 from 15.6 to 68.8 in 2010. And anyway, I've and then for the next years, then I've summarized it and put it into a graph. <laughs> and actually, it's apparently looked like this business is going well actually, because the revenues from the orchestra has grown. Um, again, I don't know the details of the. Um, of the, you know, the, the economy in Denmark Radio, but that is, that is what it tells us from 2009 to 2013 with the from the orchestra and, the, and what they made like in the concert house of Denmark Radio. And uh, I mean, uh, I also think that's, that's hugely interesting that they have succeeded with um, working, as I see it, as a cultural institution because um, that they can, I, I, I mean, I believe that that, uh, that really creates another value. I mean, you have a cultural institution rather than you are just more like a media company buying, a, you know, documentaries or whatever from other companies, which is also nice, but then distributing it. I mean, that that there are these two different ways. I mean, that's working. a fifty percent rise from yeah. two thousand nine mm -hmm. to two thousand thirteen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I mean, when I look at, been looking at this debate. Uh, they, they were not really attacked on that. I mean, that was something that you could easily use. So if it happens some other time, if it's, if it's a symphonic orchestra next time or something, I mean, then it could be really interesting to have these. But the, these are all the orchestras, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. And, uh, Together. So we don't yeah. know how much of this, uh, or have you, made, have you also looked into how much each individual Anything. orchestra had contributed? No, I, I couldn't find that. Okay. So, uh, unfortunately, I didn't have time to, uh, to find out the whole, um, you know, all the numbers, but yeah, but it could be very, very interesting to like see. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and also to look at their expenses. Yes, yeah. If their expenses had risen. Yes. Have they, have risen have they also risen by 50%? Yeah. yeah. And there was like uh, this case this year, um, but that, that actually had not something to do with the closing down of the office that, that was planned. <coughs> But they had 200 million kroner. They spent too much on the Danish, uh, what the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> they had so sure. Yeah. <laughs> and it's actually something that's been investigated now, and um, mm -hmm. maybe that will be like a, a lawsuit or something. Uh, <coughs> and uh, they are they are investigating it now, but they, they really have made um, mm -hmm. some uh, bad decisions about also the companies that use the. the but many people who like knew each other, this kind of thing that it's suddenly the budget just 
Did you find so any evidence that the uh, the axing of the entertainment orchestra had some connection with the overspending for the Eurovision Song Contest? No, okay. no, and it was uh, it was planned early on, so. Okay. What I, what so I there's find. no connection there. Okay. No, but still, I think it's interesting. I mean, such a thing can happen. Yeah. And uh, as as one wrote here, that it, you could finance uh, the orchestra uh, six and a half years for this money. That was spent on the Eurovision yeah. song. One one came here in one of the, the articles. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, again, I mean, there are, there are basically two uh, ideas about public service um, that I often meet. That either it's about uh, giving what the market market can't uh, produce, and you know. It has to be about quality and about informing people uh, and not having to think about the monetary aspect. It's like the one of the, the one view and the other view is more that they have to more give people what they want and what in more, more to be more sort of broad and and, uh, and and give people what they want basically. Mm -hmm. um, so there are these two different views uh, and I mean that such a thing happened that they could use uh, 200 million to watch I mean, to maybe show that. <laughs> and that also the way of defending it maybe, I think, could show that it's really this other idea about giving people what they want that's dominating now. Mm -hmm. Also, um, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting thing because it's uh, it's an institution that's not, it's not running on, on the same, um, I would say it's not running like a private company. It's it's run in a way by the state. They, they give the money, um, but still they, they try to act like they were like a private company. And in a way, I can understand in a way they, they want to justify themselves, and because also it's it's hard to defend um, if if you don't have enough viewers. But then there's another thing also an interesting article about uh, from the Berlin's um, Tidende the. Uh, editor wrote that uh, some of the money they are spending now, uh, or, or what they are really focusing on now, is the digital platforms, um, where they, they they want like to get all the young readers um, and viewers to like uh, to reach the market with the digital with the digital uh, platforms and strategies. But the thing is that. It's actually a huge problem. That's also why I think many of the editors of the newspapers in the debate they were highly critical about uh, what happened with the orchestra. Then they criticized, they closed the orchestra, but then at the same time they criticized the overall strategy of focusing on digital media because um, there are a lot of news, um, Denmark's radio uh, online, uh, which are written, and uh, research has shown that the vast majority of these news they actually come from the newspapers and other medias. So they just copy and quote other medias, but then they are they can like distribute it um, themselves, and uh, that is like causing a lot of um, trouble for the newspapers. It's like undermining their uh, their business. <laughs> so uh, it was interesting to when when. This happened that it was also many of the editors then uh, when they were criticizing the closing down of the orchestra, it was also this uh, was a call, you know, uh, it, it, it creates a uh, um, disadvantage, uh, what you call it, compromise for the problem. Um, well, it's just it, that is not fair competition, right. what yeah. they're doing. So, well, um, yeah, that was uh, the sort of aesthetic kind of part in the debate, uh, I see. Um, I don't know if you have any questions. Um, would you like us to pause for questions now, or do you want yeah. to do the uh, political? Uh, we just might want to add that uh, it's very nice we've been joined by Claudio Cifuentes Abunante, who will also be part of the audience making uh, comments today. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments at this point? Uh, I'd, yeah. I'd like to know this. Uh, it's very interesting when you compare the way they play Beethoven. Mm -hmm. uh, can you can you find that online? Sure. Uh, yeah. Method you have to play just so I know that I can find it and, and mm -hmm. compare it because I think yeah. it's very and it's a very good argument. Yes. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, uh, maybe. Uh, can I send you a link? You can send that later. Yeah. 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 You might want to to inform uh, also the uh, the video audience yeah. about that link, so, uh, yes. so that they can ah, yeah, find right. it. So yeah. if if they stick with us to the end of the talk, mm -hmm. then they'll get the link. Yeah. <laughs> because for me, that's really what proves. I mean, how the work, like both you need this orchestra, and and it's that it's really hard to like. <laughs> to use the argument that it's just another symphony of yeah. the so yeah. there's like a work tool in it because it's... But you, you yeah. also commented uh, when we were talking about this uh, before the talk that you didn't find that much aesthetically ground debate, grounded debate. No. That, um, and interestingly enough, that just was drowned by all of the uh, political debate and Absolutely. all of the economic debate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, isn't, it, isn't that a little odd? Didn't anybody, um, didn't anybody for example, from the uh, conservatory mm. environment feel compelled to get up and say something? Or uh, did you find anything like that among the articles? Um, well, I found some, and there was also Morten Seuer, for instance, Schellestad professor at, um, at the Music Academy in Copenhagen. He, he wrote um, about it um, and, for instance, argued that, that um, the Mass Radio's entertainment orchestra, they were also re re uh, renewing the, the, the way classical music is played and they were like mm -hmm. more future oriented and they were like happy with developing the music. And then he claims that, uh, well, he actually um, has an interesting point about this whole idea, uh, this dualistic ideas about classical music and popular music, and he thinks that's actually the problem. Um, that's, and he claims it was better 100 years ago. And he, he, he says the, the, the heart or um, the difficult music has become too difficult and the easy music has become too easy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he thinks that you should like stop dividing it like you do now. And um, and and really um, says that, that the entertainment doctors are they were really um, renewing the, the whole uh, way of communicating music and experimenting and then he suggests that it should be uh, um, that they should make it one big orchestra with the Copenhagen field and the Danish entertainment orchestra. Um, so you could like keep this orchestra that are like future oriented and they experiment and they help getting new audience. Um, yeah, and then um, there was also another musician, Milan Bicek, a former professor at Copenhagen now in Oberlin, Boston, I believe. Um, and uh, he, uh, he he had a very interesting point, a story from New York, uh, Broadway, where they had some big cuts also, many musicians that had to be fired. But then all, um, all musicians went together uh, and, uh, and made a, how do you say, they had a strike. Mm -hmm. And um, then they calculated that uh, the city of New York, each, uh, they lost uh, 7 million kroner each day. And that actually worked. Then they, they reached a compromise and they found a solution. And then uh, he also thinks, he writes as he thinks that musicians should, should like stand together and, uh, and also try and uh, do the same thing. Then maybe they could like save the um, orchestra. That was back the 24th of September. But that, I mean, that, that never really happened. Um, there was a protest, but. Well, yeah. Remember, my sort of original um, motivation for asking you to, uh, to look into this was my question originally yeah. was how did the budget for the entertainment orchestra compare with the amounts of money that are being used for all of these um, amateur uh, sort of expose amateur performers shows like X Factor or yes. uh, uh, any of the others that, yeah. that we can name. Is that something you're coming to a little later on? No, uh, I didn't afford to have time to look so much into it, but I've looked, you know, overall, I mean, 
how much money it's, it's really about and um, Danish Entertainment Orchestra uh, is really a, mi a minor expense. I mean, it doesn't matter if you compare how, how much money they, they get. Um, so I mean, it's the, the I mean the 18, the 64, for instance, is historical <laughs> uh, series that, that they make, and the X Factor is really something that's that's uh, completely other budget. I mean, that's really much. Much more expensive. It's uh, more expensive than yes. entertainment yeah, because yeah, I, I know, and, and you certainly must, uh, being a musician yourself, you must encounter musicians who, who complain that so much airtime is used now, mm -hmm. uh, giving amateurs exposure yeah. who are just yeah. sort of copying other popular singers all the time, and that's what uh, audiences are sitting and listening to rather than sitting and listening to professional musicians yeah, yeah. perform. I mean, it, uh, it's, it's again, it's a broader, it's a broader programs because I mean there's millions that are watching mm -hmm. these programs so yeah but I talked to a musician uh, it's about a month ago or something he said something very interesting you know so like what you're saying that it's it's really really hard to find any uh, programs today um, any TV programs about that's about music where it's not some kind of competition Mm -hmm. and it's really rare that it's just a um, video transmission from a concert or where they speak with the artist or something like that. It's like it's all, all a thing about com uh, Some sort of reality yeah. show. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and personally, I mean, that's, that's one thing. Um, I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's really incredible how much it's all about competition. And what I also find problematic personally is that uh, that it's it's actually ironic what you say about the reality show because it has not really that much for me to do with sort of reality if we talk about <laughs> real reality. <laughs> yeah, being a professional musician. I mean, um, I actually wrote that on my uh, homepage now and applied for internships that uh, <laughs> not not to like be holy anything, but I don't watch X Factor because I don't I don't believe in ninety percent talent and ten percent hard work but the other way around <laughs> because uh, that's what I think these programs are often about that, that you you just have to have a bit of talent and then two weeks of training maybe and then you just own the world <laughs> and yeah but there seems to be a big market for that and that's also why then my friend is saying okay that's what they should provide um, but again I mean it's uh, it's a difficult discussion really because on the other hand, none, none, none of the winners ever make a breakthrough. I mean, you forget them after half a year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They exist that they, even though they make recordings with very famous producers, mm -hmm. and they never, they never reach a, a, a broader audience. So it's mm -hmm. completely absurd, actually. And if they do, then uh, at some point something is like going wrong. And all. Yeah. I mean, you all, always see this pattern. Yeah. There's also actually a, a pianist there. There's Charlie Tibode, a French pianist, who also said something in an interview with I thought was also very interesting that um, he's, I mean, one of my favorite pianists, really fantastic musician. Um, he said that, that for him, uh, I mean, he plays concert in the United States, Europe, and he's really uh, has a huge career as a pianist. He even <laughs> has his own uh, designer in New York who designs his concert clothes. And it's really, I mean, um, and, and by the way, he has also had quite a lot of success with uh, getting uh, the young people to listen to his concerts. Also, actually, by the way, he's like uh, not being too conservative and he has like this fashion clothes and these things, but, but still plays fantastically. And, and it's not like too much where he has funny hair or something like that, just really sort of fashion. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, he said that for him, uh, it was really important that everything came gradually as an artist. Uh, he started you know, as a young, uh, not like a wunderkind, but he practiced a lot of interest and then it, it just came gradually. He won some small competition and then he won some bigger competition and it was just a gradual development. And he said, um, the danger is, he, he made this analogy that uh, you can build a house in one night, it's possible, but the house will be much more shaky, like if you do it in three months or something. And I think that's a really good way of saying it. That there are also these people even on to classical music, then they, they're not so well known and then suddenly they win some 
very big competition, maybe Tchaikovsky or something. And then suddenly, uh, I mean, they come from being relatively unknown to suddenly being really well known. And then there's a lot of pressure from the outside world. Like now, they really have to like deliver. And um, and I think all of these programs, I mean, that's really what they <laughs> often do to people, and it's it's very very hard to like uh, to cope with that as a human, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, but it's still different if you've been if you've been practicing an instrument for uh, for twelve or thirteen years yeah. and then win a competition rather than just coming sort of out of nowhere and doing it within a, yeah. a season, mm -hmm. as it were. Yeah. 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 But I'm sure this discussion will also be interesting for uh, many of the people who hopefully will tune into our YouTube channel from other countries because mm -hmm. you see this phenomenon everywhere. Yeah. You know these uh, reality yeah. uh, music promotion shows, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, it would be interesting in the in the comments, mm -hmm. which people then will be able to write in after they see this video, uh, what people will have to say from from other countries. Because I know that uh, for at least oh six or seven years now. I've heard comments such as the ones that I mentioned um, several minutes ago from professional musicians here in Denmark that they were becoming increasingly concerned at the time and the money and the uh, energy yeah. that was being used in these um, sort of amateur reality show music uh, formats rather than promoting uh, seriously played uh, music by trained people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah. any other comments before? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. For me the concern is not, not so, much, so much about if they are trained or not, but about the vision. Mm -hmm. I, I think the difference between the amateurs and the artists are that the, the artists, they often have a vision. Mm. And then they want to fulfill that vision or Accomplish that wish in, in some way. Like the programs. Uh, we have this uh, young girl, a young guy who sings, blah, blah, and then the uh, judges uh, tell them, now we have to find your way of doing it, or your wishing, or something like that. So mm -hmm. they have nothing, they have no uh, substance inside of them. They are only um, mm -hmm. performing their only voice and look, but there's nothing inside of them that drives them. Mm -hmm. So then, if they get to say, then they, of course, uh, collapse uh, right away because they have nothing inside of them. That will, they have no vision for who they are, what they will accomplish with their mm -hmm. talents. So there's nothing yeah. in comparison to artists who will keep on going because they have a higher goal mm. for yes. their careers. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, also, if, put that in, I mean, if, if, if the goal is like to get famous, I mean, then it's, it's really, as an artist. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then we got an artist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, so in a way, what you're talking about, John, is, is sort of a, a, a musical identity or a musical foundation. Um, I, I guess because that's also what Jean was talking about a bit earlier when you said that the entertainment orchestra had been playing for more than 70 years, and and an, a, a orca, an orchestra needs a certain amount of time to find its own musical identity and really to have something to, to build upon mm -hmm. and I think it's the same thing with, with these people in, in, in these uh, amateur uh, talent shows that, that, that the show itself is about finding some sort of musical identity yeah. for the person uh, or, or trying to find what's in there to, to build upon but I mean for a trained musician there are years and years and years of studies to build upon and, and, and they have some sort of musical mm. identity based on their history. And the same thing with, with the orchestra. Yeah. So, so I, I agree with what you're saying and I agree with what you're saying. Okay, why don't we continue then with part two? All right. Yes, then let's get into it with the... The bus will arm ah, in the fancy oh, yeah. uh, Well, to the short story is that the government gives uh, the money to uh, Denmark Radio and then decide how to spend it. 
So just, just to refresh uh, the memory of yes. our English-speaking audience, the arms thing you can see that, that was keeping things at arm's yes, length. Yes, arm's length. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, yes, um, that's like the short story. And that was also what the minister used as an argument. It's, it's about this arm's length you can see. Uh, we have to like. And also, it's, it's also uh, based on this idea about the, the media has to be independent. Uh, also, uh, what was it? Washington, George Washington said when he established uh, the media. I think it says it very well that he would rather want um, uh, newspapers without government than uh, government uh, without newspapers. <laughs> so, um, so it's this very deeply. Um, how can you say? It's also about this really. Um, this idea that's all, always been about that you should separate media and, and politics. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the short story. But then the long story is that actually this is all a matter of negotiation. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's both a media compromise where they decide who, who gets uh, the money and how much. And, uh, and then the public service contract, which is between yeah, also Democrat and the politician, where they decide uh, which obligations Denmark Radio has as and a public service uh, institution. Uh, yeah. If you Denmark Radio and the Minister of Culture, then uh, Marianne Yelva, then listen to a majority in the parliament. Well, that's the question that I did a bit before I to find my notes. Um, yeah, because um, I mean, the, the idea is that. that uh, the reason that there are these negotiations and all these things is that, that as a public service channel you have like um, an obligation to service the public. So, uh, and that, that, that implies that, that the, the, the public has to um, have an influence what is being, uh, what they produce. And that is like them going through, the idea at least is the politicians who are like representing the public. And then to negotiate and find out, okay, how do we meet and make something that that satisfies the the, uh, the population. Um, yeah, so that's like the principle at least. And then the question is, if it all was uh, foiled by, or I can see I have to skip this. It says pause. <laughs> if it all was paused by the battle for power, <laughs> I think that was a good picture line. You're talking to me. <laughs> because uh, <laughs> looks like it. Um, yeah. Well, um, go ahead, count me, my dear. Yeah. Um, well, what happened was about this um, that that they went. It started that Denmark Radio announced the plans to shut down the entertainment orchestra, and then the uh, protest uh, started to arise. And, and then the question is if Denmark Radio was surprised about that. Because there was one, uh, this question, uh, so Jakob Levinsen, this uh, brilliant cultural uh, journalist, uh, uh, Weekend Levinsen, he wrote that he thought it was all about the so called uh, Washington Monument Syndrome. And it's about that. Uh, if you have to make some, you have to make some cuts as politicians, or now it's the case of Denmark Radio, then you choose something which is really popular, something that people, the population will really feel and they will be really unsatisfied about. Because then protests will arise and then you can use that to try to put pressure to find a compromise or to cancel the plans. So that was actually his idea that, that it was not because Denmark Radio thought that that the orchestra was com uh, completely unnecessary, actually that they knew it, it really was a valuable thing and it was very popular. But therefore they used it like in a sort of, uh, how can you say, in, yeah, as a, a strategic way to like try to put pressure on the politicians to give them more money. Uh, but it's difficult when you have money and Yilda who's really an experienced politician that I don't think, I mean, also what happened later, but, but I mean, when she's decided something that is you not like uh, accept to be pushed by anyone <laughs> um, because then what, what was interesting was that 
there started to appear unusual political alliances, which, I mean, I'm not uh, studying uh, politics, but I've personally not seen such alli uh, alliances before the way it was Dansk Folkeparti and uh, Enhedslisten and uh, Venstre and Conservative. So it was really the, the right wing and the left wing, I mean, just huge uh, alliances that had a really, really big span. Um, Who never would cooperate under other circumstances. Exactly, yeah. Uh, and then there was a funny thing in Venstre, uh, because they had an uh, entire energy and, and when um, when it started in September, they announced their plans to close down the orchestra. She said in the radio, in uh, Denmark Radio P8, she said that um, she thought that, uh, like Yelve, that uh, the, uh, the arms length principle, the arms length principle, they, they, they should really stick to that. They should stay out of how Denmark Radio they uh, they uh, prioritize. But <laughs> then she went on uh, what's it called, Basel. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, uh, maternity. maternity. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and then Michael Ostrovienten is a cultural affairs spokesman, she is a political spokesman. Then he uh, came into the, like, the debate, and then he suddenly said the complete opposite that it would be wrong to close down the Danish Entertainment Orchestra. And uh, I read some uh, articles because then, then many journalists thought, ah, oh, that's, that's pretty interesting, that's completely opposite. And then they, they tried to. Uh, to get a comment from Ellen Tan Norbert, but she wouldn't say anything. And uh, so a lot of speculation about she was in a way shut up. And then, yeah, and then there's Miguel Astor, then he, he started really to to say, okay, we are, we are going against the Ministry of Culture. Um, yes, and uh, then Yellow was put under pressure from many, many sides. Everyone was like, uh, yeah, really um, unsatisfied with what she was doing. Um, well, no one knows the motives, of course, that's what I wrote out about, about uh, Venstre, I mean, how, why they made this u um, Was it because it was really important for them, the Denmark Radio Orchestra, uh, this, uh, was it uh, cultural politics or was it more uh, populism? I mean, it's, it's hard to know, mm -hmm. because I, I think, I mean, what I've really thought about is all these political alliances. I, I know that um, all the world Tomatic said that the Danish uh, Musician union and there are lots of uh, musicians that uh, are lobbying uh, and have tradition for that in interest list, and they, they have a strong connection. So that that was maybe you could imagine. maybe you just want to say a word on, on what kind of party in his list is. Ah, in his list, that's like a left wing party, I'd say. Yeah. Um, so yeah, to the farthest left in Danish politics. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, uh, and then there was the other part is uh, conservatives. It was about the culture that we had, like to to keep the orchestra because it was part of our cultural heritage and all these things. And uh, yeah, and then there was then Folke Party was kind Which of is very right. Yeah, that, that's a right wing party. Yeah, mm -hmm. and normally they're not so much into their cult cultural politics. They're more, you know, mm -hmm. sort of the, the broader. I'd say, mm -hmm. uh, culture they like, uh, how can you say, prioritize higher, but, but anyway, they even uh, started to threaten Yelvik with a, oh, I forgot to translate that mist in this photo, um, <laughs> what's it called, where, where you expressed your... Uh, yeah, so it's a vote of uh, no confidence. Yeah, right, right, vote of no confidence. Yeah. Vote of no confidence, exactly. Um, so, uh, yeah, they really played the uh, high... Uh, game high was, stakes. Yeah, yeah high stakes. Uh, and then in the end it was in his list. Uh, there's a left wing party that had the deciding power. But they would not want to make this um, this well, what's it called Vincent? Vote of No Confidence. No confidence. Yeah, vote of no confidence. They did not want to do that. They did not want to they go. They didn't want to push it that far. No, exactly. They did not want to go uh, push so far. And uh, then a compromise was suggested that uh, Denmark Radio would uh, put six million into the Danish Symphonic Orchestra and then make a small ensemble with 20 musicians uh, instead. So they, they tried like, to find a compromise, but it got rejected. Uh, Venstre wanted to use some uh, of the money that Denmark Radio earns, because they, Denmark Radio earns the money that people are paying, uh, all citizens are paying like uh, 2,000 something each year, Krona. 
um, to uh, to the, the license it's called. Um, and in case any anybody's wondering, it's called in Denmark's radio, but of course it's television and yes, radio it's and media in general. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's um, it's a bit like the BBC in a way, just right. Yeah, right. So for Denmark. Yeah. <laughs> You might want to, while we're taking a, a short uh, pause here, say something about the party from which uh, Marianne Yelvet comes. The yes. The picture there. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, my Yelvet, she comes uh, <laughs> from, the part, from the party in Denmark. If you translate it, the name of the party is uh, Radical Left, <laughs> but it's actually a center party, <laughs> even though it's called the Radical Left. But Danish politics is a bit strange. It's not the right or no, then. It's not the radical left. No, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> But it's like um, I'd say many is say it's like sort of intellectual uh, political part. It has about now eight percent, I believe. But it, historically, it has only been it has uh, how could we say points about its weight historically because uh, it's not been so big. But but it's uh, they've corroborated it both with the left and the right. And uh, yeah, I believe we have had one. Uh, Prime Minister of all two from the radical left or something like that, but they all they've all uh, always been brilliant. That's the strategic game, and because they're in the middle, they can like get the deciding power. Um, their cultural politics are traditional. It's called um, mm -hmm. Kultur mm -hmm. uh, Actually, pretty, I'd say, um, yeah, a kind of elitist. Actually, mm -hmm. yeah, but still with some idea that that culture should have a close connection to societal matters. Yeah, mm -hmm. that you, you get uh, you you get social improvement through cultural challenge. So just mm -hmm. Right, and but when you say cultural challenge, it, it's uh, the kind of culture that they've advocated has been usually higher culture, That's quality. Right. It's, higher it's, quality culture. Uh, right. The cultural elite uh, mm. in Denmark is very much of sort of uh, uh, cultural radical nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, well actually before uh, my Nilo we had another uh, cultural minister also from the radical minister. And he was uh, very controversial, especially amongst classical musicians, because he wanted to give more money to the popular music, and he did have two eyes also about classical music and uh, many uh, thought. Uh, he actually also, bef uh, when he was, uh, he had, I wrote, uh, read at some point, uh, commented that he thought there was too many orchestras in Denmark radio. But anyway, then... And his uh, name being? Uffe Elbeck. Yeah, yeah. Uffe Elbeck. His, uh, he started a new political party today called the Alternative. So, uh, but he so was for our, anybody watching YouTube out there, if you want <laughs> a, a really interesting and time-consuming hobby, you could begin to uh, immerse yourselves Danish cultural politics. Uh, oh, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, anyway, he was replaced by Maja Nielven. She is a very, very experienced politician, and he, she has really been used to working with so many governments. And she was also with Paul Schlüter. The, Danish um, conservative um, prime minister who well, he was mm, prime minister for was it nine years or something? Yeah, it was it was time time. yeah. And uh, and it was really a government that was characterized by many political parties working together and in a way the conservative was like a, they had like to move to the middle and to have like a social conservative politics politics to make everything function, but it was actually a minority government. Um, and that's something that's also very uh, normal in Denmark to have a minority government. But but all what she was like in the government all, all uh, she has lots of experience also working uh, together when when you can say uh, under difficult conditions, really getting things to work and do your job as as politician and negotiate these things. So uh, yeah. What happened was then the compromise was rejected about making this new small orchestra. Venstre saw the, the, the um, right uh, wing party, the biggest party in Denmark now, uh, not uh, centre right, I would say. <laughs> um, they, they disagreed that it was a, about the solution. They wanted uh, to use some extra money in Denmark radio to, uh, to keep the Denmark's uh, the entertainment orchestra. 
the trouble was that this extra money is from the licenses that the uh, citizens are paying to the government or Denmark Radio <laughs> to um, um, to have license to view the TV and listen to the radio. But every household with, with television yeah. pays a license and then, Yeah, and each year there are some extra money they get from licenses, but it's a very, uh, that's called variable income. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really hard to know how, how much money uh, um, how much money they get each year, so it was kind of, um, that that was not, I mean, that was rejected by other parties because it was not, it was financial, it not completely, it would not be a completely responsible thing to do, otherwise it's, I mean, then they should make some other costs in Denmark Radio and then they should use this money alternatively. Well, well, anyway, in this lesson they only wanted to, uh, they wanted also to keep the Denmark Radio uh, entertainment orchestra, but they wanted more money uh, that was also rejected. Uh, but then what Gelbe did was, uh, at least many articles claimed that she used this um, disagreement in the opposition uh, to like, she, she tried even to strengthen the, the disagreement just uh, so, so she could like get them distracted and get them to fight <laughs> with, uh, with each other and then she could like make a decision. So that was what she did in the end and said, okay, we are closing down the orchestra, we, we, do, uh, we let Denmark Radio decide. Um, so I think it's it's also I think it has also been very very unfortunate what happened. I mean, maybe if there were because now there'll be an election when yeah this year at some point and uh, believe in politics and now now everyone is trying like to uh, make lots of these <coughs> small games and all and they try to use every opportunity to get something they can use against the the government. Uh, to, to get more popular themselves. Uh, so I think there's a great deal also of bad timing and, and if they had not uh, pushed her like that and tried to cooperate more and not maybe think so much about power, maybe we had another situation today. Uh, I don't know, but I mean, I think it's very unfortunate in terms of the way it happened because, I mean, as such an experienced politician as it was, you would not like just say, okay, now, now I, I, uh, I like, how can I say, surrender and uh, you know, it's Back not, down. Uh, it's yeah. not, not, not how she works. Um, okay. But it, it, it was Denmark Radio that decided to... <coughs> yes, it was because Denmark Radio. It's a very funny situation. It's nearly a, a cultural strategy. The same with the language here. It was not the minister, it was the day between. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they, they, they keep a kind of uh, a kind of uh, uh, a, 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 a kind of uh, a task. Mm -hmm. You have to resolve that. You decide how, and so they they lift their hands. <laughs> <laughs> so what the plot is referring to is that uh, this university uh, was subject to a uh, uh, quite a dramatic cut in uh, the amount of uh, study slots that would be allotted for uh, people in the humanities. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, if I understood this correctly, and this is quite a complicated thing, so I don't want to make any mistakes when I try to summarize this, but the university was told you can figure out yourselves, yourselves yes. where this cut, these cuts will take place. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Unfortunately, the decision was to cut the Spanish department, uh, Arabic languages, and the Chinese, and the Chinese yeah. department. Yes, yeah, so a university which not long before had said it wanted to profile itself as an international university, so go figure. But um, so, if I understood this correctly, then at the end of the day, Denmark's audio was said just save the money and you can save it where you'd like to? Was that it? You said that, that, uh, that, yeah. uh, that, that Denmark's radio mm. was given the ultimate authority about what they wanted to cut out. Is yes, that true? Yes, yeah. Okay. And they made a deal with the cultural minister and I said, okay, no blueprint, blue yeah. Mm. So, uh, but, but there's been a lot of debate also about it because uh, she had like also majority against her. Uh, in the in 
in the parliament. She's been used to that also under the future <laughs> government, so she knows how to deal with that. But, but anyway, um, you can say what she was blamed for by her opponents was also uh, was that she didn't listen to this majority and that was what you should do. I mean, it's not something that says by law or that you should always say. It's just how can you say uh, they claimed it was sort of a uh, good, um, how can you say, um, sort of good way of working as, or good etiquette mm -hmm. as a politician. If you have majority against it, okay, then, then you listen. Uh, but I, I, th I thought that was was quite interesting. And, but again, I mean, it can be a majority, but they can have so many different reasons. And, and if it's just about power, uh, I mean, <laughs> If the motive is power, again, we, we cannot know, we can only speculate. I mean, then but then there was talk about uh, funding coming from private sources yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. So, so how does this story continue once the yes, um, decision has been made now that it won't be government funded anymore? It's privately funded now, yeah. And it's called the Danish Entertainment Orchestra. They have an internet site, I just looked at it. So it's coming from private donations. And um, I, I think I'll get back to that shortly. But but that that's how they are doing now. I just I just had some articles that I thought was um, was interesting. Um, yeah, <laughs> about the boards in Danish media because uh, Danish um, radio because they had to decide uh, to make this decision. But after it happened, they decided to um, to close down the orchestra. The the, the vice chairman. Uh, said in the media that he was really against it, and in the, the, the board they have really not agreed. On, so it, it was a majority that won in the board, and then this, they decided it. But he said it was really a loss of culture and all these things. Uh, <laughs> but then the other uh, members of the board then started writing in the newspapers about that. That was not what he said in the meeting to begin with. And then you know it's just uh, how can you say? Um, Argument against argument, and you can never really know what happened in these meetings in that <laughs> radio. But uh, but but Ole Hultoft, he really said, the uh, vice chairman, that it, it was he thought it was really bad. They closed it, and uh, now they get a new they get new people in the board now. But, but I think that was just very interesting. Uh, there have been some I mean conflicts for sure in Denmark radio about doing this. Um, so yeah. There was also the thing about the public service contract because what um, other politicians also tried to use was that uh, the orchestra was written in the contract that it, it uh, had to be part of, uh, it was part of this public service contract and so it would be illegal if they closed it down. Um, but then they actually, what they did in the end was to change the contract and, and write it out of the contract. But, uh, but there are many of these things also uh, in the media. I think that was also a lot about you know the rules and uh, law and all these things. Uh, but um, but there are so incredibly many uh, gray zones and uh, and everyone was like trying to use it and say oh that's unlawful and that's not how you should do. Uh, but in the end, I mean, it's it's really uh, I mean it's it's really more I think about also. Politics, uh, political uh, strategy, um, and and the Danish radio orchestra also became in a way a victim of that. Um, so if we jump to the conclusion, I have to check if yeah, right discussion or <laughs> how do we understand aesthetics and how should we discuss it? Because also being a musician. Uh, that was actually under the former cultural minister, I also wrote um, a comment uh, in the newspaper with one of my friends and we had some things going on because uh, this Uwe Elbeck, he wanted to give less money to classical music and uh, we had tried to argue against it. Uh, as I believe we wrote them uh, many years ago, we wrote about it, the headline was uh, Musical, uh, how can you say it? Uh, like where you put a um, musical ping tank. <laughs> musical, you know, where you keep money, these saves. Uh, mm -hmm. It was like kind of wordplay because they, they wanted to have a think tank 
Mm -hmm. New musicals thing thing we do, it's sort of telling us. It was musical money thing instead. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. musical money thing instead. Uh, but when we had this debate, I mean, uh, also it was mainly people from the music academy who wrote uh, the trap that many people went into with both links, so to say, was uh, starting to, uh, you know, judge too much and, and be too um, patronizing against. Uh, against, you know, what's not sort of um, classical culture. Um, I mean, I think it's a very difficult debate. I mean, how should you argue when, when from an aesthetics point of view, when, when these things are happening? Uh, but but I think there was a great example also with, uh, with Morton Soil, uh, for instance, from the Danish Academy, who said that it was about renewing the classical music and being future-oriented, you know, really, you know, having your eyes out, I mean, to how can we develop classical music and again to try to challenge this very conservative view because it can so easily be uh, misused even also as we saw by, by Denmark Radio. Um, but, uh, but again, I mean, there's also many, many other things, you know, there's an economics, there's an economic perspective and these, these kind of things that uh, like me, let me see the, the, the New York case where they they, they um, informed the, the mayor that they lost these seven million. I mean, that's also a sort of clever way of doing it. But um, yeah, I just uh, I don't know what what um, if you should, if you should like defend classical music from an aesthetics point of view. I mean, uh, have you some ideas also about that? Uh, because I think it's it's a difficult one. <laughs> You mean as a, as a on on the grounds that uh, that what that if you're speaking with somebody who doesn't uh, who's not interested in classical music or yeah. how would you argue that yeah uh, without sort of uh, being without being a snobbish yeah. or okay, <laughs> okay. any thoughts <laughs> mm -hmm. um, this uh, situation of uh, the entertainment orchestra it reminded me of. Uh, uh, the closing down of a, a TV channel from my home country, from Romania. Mm -hmm. uh, the Romanian uh, national television, which has uh, several channels like Channel 1, Channel 2, Channel 3, uh, the, and uh, they had the news channel and the cultural channel. And the news channel and the cultural channel, uh, they were shut down several years ago, and the uh, the television, they uh, uh, said that it was due, due to financial reasons, primarily. But uh, I think it's, um, it's uh, uh, they were very appropriate about uh, this thing because, um, yeah, they don't have uh, money for the cultural channel, but uh, they have money to uh, uh, pay so-called celebrities just to come to several reality shows. Mm -hmm. Some people might hate me for saying that, but it's the truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That seems strange to shut down a, a news channel. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, the news channel and the cultural channel. They were shut down. Yeah, they were shut down several years ago. Well, I don't know how I would sort of defend classical uh, music from the aesthetic point of view, but I, I would certainly say that the diff if you know something, if you're, you're familiar with the aesthetics of classical music and popular music, uh, you could argue that, that uh, the differentiation is some kind of artificial, mm. that sort of the, the, the uh, the rationality of them, I mean, the experience you can get from listening, from, uh, is, 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 they are very much the same. Mm. Uh, so it is all music, so to speak. Uh, and if people can't, people don't know that, it's probably because they, well, it requires perhaps a bit more listening in classical music, but I don't really think it's that much. I mean, it's, mm. uh, I don't know. And then again, Uffe Elbeck didn't know anything about his death ex. I mean, as Vito said, he would like circus music. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, uh, one of my... Um, uh, actually, you know, it, was a, it was a teacher from the, the university who discussed culture. 
uh, and discuss the whole thing about uh, economical capital and cultural mm -hmm. capital and how to, you know, all the, of how you can, uh, how can they locate different, uh, I can say, kind of music and culture at, at a sort of spectrum and, and he said that he, uh, that ballet would not, so would be something that he, he would, um, here, or he wouldn't. He had never seen an LA and he would never uh, do it because he that would not be something for him. Mm -hmm. uh, just like okay, will you say that without ever having experienced it? Mm -hmm. How can you then say that? Yeah. He was like, oh yeah, well. Mm -hmm. uh, well then, then he's don't know what he would try, try to not to like pull back away. But but I think that that just shows really that was just an example. I mean, what unfortunately often means that that people can often sort of. Talk about it without having experience. That's right. That's just really that's right. um, unfortunate. And but if I think it's about what's happening in the media now, we have a theory also, and we work with in journalism that's called the commer commercialization of mm. media and, and uh, capitalization of media. And there are many um, like uh, what do you call it? Researchers that have been uh, writing about it, that that is something that has been happening in the media in the past. 20, 30 years that it has come much more, become much more uh, dependent on the, on money and you know how to earn money and and now with journalism and media also something that's happening now which I find quite interesting and also a bit concerning is uh, hidden uh, commercial also in newspapers for instance especially uh, Metro Express they have lots of um, articles that appears to be journalism. But it's really a combination for some product, and if you're reading it quickly, I mean, then it's, it can be really, really hard to distinguish. Mm -hmm. But that's a new way of financing news. That's, I mean, it's uh, uh, it's um, many newspapers now are in crisis and they have really trouble uh, creating revenue. But this is actually a way of using it. There are lots of money in this way of uh, sort of hidden commercial and product placement, all these things. I could throw out just a. Uh an observation. I haven't really thought yeah. this through because uh, I, I think it's very interesting that you, you have these discussion uh, questions up on the screen and that you'd uh, like us to, to contribute like this. But um, I remember when I was at a, a meeting of the American Society for Aesthetics this past fall, I was having a discussion with one of my colleagues who, uh, uh, before she became an academic and uh, then concentrated on philosophy and aesthetics, uh, she'd been a dancer on Broadway, and uh, we were talking about what that had been like. And when I was uh, significantly younger and growing up in the United States, I was absolutely mad about the Broadway musical, and I loved going to them. And uh, so I would, uh, as the years go by, went by, I would continue to try either fly were in New York or some other world capital, because then you know I was living in more international life, I'd try to get to musicals every once in a while. And then I noticed as the years went by, there were always fewer musicians in the pit. Mm -hmm. There was a lot more um, sort of synthesized background music that would get plugged in. Um, and I remember she was talking about how uh, increasingly, you know, the sounds of the tapping was manipulated in, in uh, tap dancing and all of that. And, and I was, was saying, you know, it's an extension of my comments, and I just found it to be more and more disappointing and less satisfying then, and I don't think it was just nostalgia, then when you went and there really were all these musicians yeah. in the pit, and, and there were all these people on stage singing, and she, she paused, and, and this is the comment now that she made that I want to uh, develop a little bit in connection with a possible answer to why the, the orchestra and things like that should continue to be funded. She said, well, I can understand that, she said, because there were not as many people working together to give you their talent. Right. And I thought that was a very nice, there were not that many people offering their talent to you. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, that was a rather astute way of putting that and sort of summarizing, I think she did put her finger on 
where I was feeling cheated, because that's the word I used. I remember I used the word before she made that comment. I said, I was feeling more and more cheated when I went to a, a, a musical. And um, I don't think that given the, uh, the history of the way an orchestra plays and works together, that one would ever go to a, an orchestra concert and suddenly see that an entire section was somehow pre-recorded and played in the uh, performance. So I think one could continue to keep that tradition of all these people working together simultaneously to offer you their talent. And that's an experience that has its own character. And of course, I think unfortunately, um, I'm sort of making this up as I go along, that uh, some of that aspect has been very misused in the last 10 to 15 years by these endless um, comparisons with uh, business leaders, between business leaders and orchestra conductors and stuff like this, you know. Um, which often I think are, are completely off the mark because one of the really important things about an orchestra is that all the people who are playing in it have been socialized for years to be able to do what they're doing and that's really not usually the case in, a, in, in many sort of business setups. But I think the fact that you have um, a group of people who have been trained to do what they do for most of a lifetime and really and this, this, of course, is now I'm getting on some, some shaky aesthetic and philosophical ground, but I'm going to say this anyway. Who really can do what they're doing? Who really is sitting there? And when, 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 if you were playing a concerto with an orchestra, it would really be you sitting down at that instrument, your fingers hitting the keys and playing it. And that's what's going on with the people who are in the violin section, that's what's going on with the people in the horn section, that's what's going on. So what you have, back to my discussion with my colleague at the American Society for Science, you truly experience this, this human cooperative effort and this massive offering of talent. And I think there's something there's something unique about that that doesn't just, that's not reducible to what is on a recording or what could be combined if you've got uh, half the musicians, but then you've got the drums, you know, on a track somewhere, and you've got, you know, uh, a few, uh, you've got the Celeste on a track somewhere because that's a pain in the neck to bring out and have somebody pay, like, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, it, it's ephemeral, but I think it's an ephemeral in a very, very important way, and I think that there is something that's just not, I think we lose something if we lose that experience and uh, people can't go and have it on a somewhat regular basis anymore. Yeah. 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 Yeah, okay, so, so I was thinking about your question, and I, I think it's not an easy question to answer, but I do think that a part of my answer would have to do with the preservation of art, because what we're talking about here is, of course, um, an art form where the art itself, the music, it's, it's interpreted and performed, and, and that's not true for all art forms, that's true for, for classical music, for instance. Um, so, so I don't think it's an adequate way to preserve classical music to just have the, the, the notes and the scores or to have a recording. I, right. I do not think that's an adequate way to preserve music. But then the next question becomes uh, one that goes like this. So if, if that's true, then why should Denmark's radio do it and, or, or why should Denmark's radio preserve the repertoire of this particular orchestra or the tradition of this particular orchestra. And there I think that the, the, the answer must be, be that, well, they should do it, they should keep the orchestra. The orchestra sort of fits a role that no other orchestra fits. And, and I think that you've given us a, a, a few good reasons to believe that that's actually the case with probably the case with uh, the entertainment orchestra. 
So I think that would be a very good reason to, 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 to keep the orchestra. But I think that all, also a part of the extended answer must be uh, one that has to do with, with tradition, because one could ask, so, so if, perform, if it's about um, the preservation of interpreted and performed music, then why not just skip the entertainment orchestra and hire a bunch of gospel singers or a bunch of Tibetan road singers or, or what, what do I know? Because it's also important to preserve that musical tradition. But then I think that the answer must be, well, it has to do with the musical tradition in Denmark and the national identity and the identity of that particular orchestra and that particular media corporation and this people. Um, so, so, so I think it's very difficult to give a, a, a good full answer for your question, but I think that at least it, it has to in involve some of those aspects. Mm. Yeah, and I think the reason it's difficult is that we, uh, we perhaps are in a special, we're at a special point in history now where uh, sort of superficial alternatives exist. Right. You know, if you wanted to hear this kind of music at all 150 years ago, you had to have an orchestra. Right. You know, and so I think it's because now we're, we're standing on the cusp of this age of uh, uh, simulation and uh, uh, walking into holograms right. and th this kind of thing that we, we're starting to have these, these perhaps more, yeah, which would say bordering on deeply philosophical discussions about what it, what is it to have a real musical experience or not. We have moments in the Johnny. Yeah. Yes, and I say in connection with, with what you said before things, yeah, because I think it's very true of what you said that, uh, about the about the the argumentation for for classical music, because I think it's also a very good antidote to the amateurism we experience in the reality world, for instance. Because, for instance, I love to go to the opera. Mm -hmm. I can't really explain why, but it, it has something to do, it happens here and now. Mm -hmm. But you get some very odd experiences seeing an opera, especially if you live outside of Copenhagen, because they, they tour with Yuskri Pogor or something. And I remember one incident where they played Manon School. Mm -hmm. And Manon School, is supposed to be a beautiful young woman uh, around 18 years of age. And this she was performed by a gigantic woman. And the lover who was to be really a natural lover. He was a short, bald guy, you know, but they sang so beautifully. And, and you, you just, I, I, in the beginning I thought, well, this will never work. This is, not, this is going to be an experience because it's not going to work, but it worked. And everyone was struggling to, to give us the experience, and then you didn't really it didn't really matter what their appearance was in contrast to X Factor, for instance, because you felt it was deeper, it was more profound, uh, what this was all about. And I think that is the capacity of classical music in connection with trained musicians, because every average musician in a symphonic orchestra is very very good. I mean. Can I shoot one comment in yeah. before you, you said? And you know, I think that, that uh, going to the theater is an analogy here too. And, or, or, and sometimes uh, you can see filmed productions of drama which are so good that they're almost like going to the theater. But my point being that even that, you know, if you've been watching a lot of, of uh, movies and whatever, and then suddenly, you see one that is really an excellent piece of drama. You're brought up short and you say, yeah, now I remember what that is like. And, it, you, uh, and I think that, that, that having the experience is important because you can, there is a sense in which these things, I, I hate to say this, I think they can be lost. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you don't uh, have this experience, <laughs> If you don't make this possible so that people can have these experiences, they're not going to, they're not going to know what they're missing, you know. Uh, and just uh, showing, you know, playing a recording and, and showing a movie of it or, or whatever. And there are some fantastic opera productions out there now that you can, can see, you know, on DVDs and whatever. 
still it's not the same no. as being in the hall mm -hmm. with all that talent being offered to you live, as it were. So um, I, I think that, that it's important. And then, and Johnny, I'll, I'll stop in a second, but there's just another point that we might want to return to. This occurred to me that, uh, and this is a much bigger discussion, it's what, what should a city have as its offerings? You know, do you really think you're in a proper international city if there isn't an orchestra and there's not an opera and there's not a good uh, selection of art museums and there's not, I mean, th this whole, I mean, this is up for debate now. What, what are cities of the future going to be like and what should we be spending money on in our cities now? But uh, if, if the whole question of the aesthetics of urban culture I think are, are crucial here and that if uh, these kinds of cultural institutions disappear, aren't, is, isn't the soul of cities sort of slowly being uh, siphoned out of them, as, as it were? But maybe we need to have a whole semester series on, uh, <laughs> uh, on that as well. But okay, Johnny. Yeah, you can just look at Germany where they have a yeah, hundred opera yeah. houses mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the, a totally uh, different angle to this. Um, uh, DR or Den Denmark's radio are uh, having the same struggle uh, now as the newspapers had uh, five to ten years ago. Yeah. Their viewers, uh, more or less. And I have been, uh, I have been a teacher uh, for some years in the uh, what's called Aarbygning. Yeah. They are fifteen or sixteen years old. Uh, the pupils I have had, mm -hmm. and and none of them, none of them are uh, watching TV. They are, they are using the internet. None of them use uh, Demax Radio's uh, television uh, channels for anything, really. None of them. Yeah. So they, they have a big, big problem uh, with the, the coming generations because uh, look, uh, watching TV, as we, we know, uh, our, as we are used to by uh, turning on and then maybe looking for hours and hours of uh, whatever, they are not schooled in that way. They choose from the internet, I'm going to look at this, and then I'm going to do something else. Yeah. That whole uh, flow of uh, sometimes you, you, you look at some things you don't even want to look at, mm -hmm. and, and so on and so on, yeah. they, they, they don't experience that. And they go on YouTube and look at uh, stupid cats or something. But that's a very... Uh, cute kittens. Yeah, cute kittens. Yeah. In a way, it's a very uh, democratic way of... Uh, of spending your time, or you could you could argue, because there's not uh, one guy in a, in a central place who is telling everybody what to watch. Mm. But on the other hand, uh, Dynamics Radio they have a big problem, I think, with uh, with, with reaching, the coming uh, generations. With the coming generations, yeah. I think it was really interesting. Yeah, I had uh, Jimmy Mame and uh, the CEO of Huffington Post visits this um, university. Three months ago was something like that. So I went about it. Was really really interesting because they are one of the media that really had success. Mm. Um, and and we also talked about the things and that the, <laughs> all the the cat videos and all the stuff mm -hmm. that um, that they can just see statistically that, that people and he said it's not just young people. It's all people. They are clicking on these stories. But then he said, but it's really not. A, they have a joke at Huffington Post that uh, people come for the Kardashians but stay for the Obamas. I said that was what it's all about. They, he said he would never want it to be like a, the other media's were doing that. They, then it's only cat stories. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, and it, it, it's also funny sometimes to see uh, also information the Danish newspaper. Well, I think it's one of great great newspaper. But anyway, they, they even also a couple of months ago had a cat story. But then it was more about you know, uh, oh the cat is really you know a fierce uh, animal and uh, <laughs> but they're still cute and this sort of strange. It's quite funny. But anyway. Then he said that, that they, they don't want they don't want to measure themselves just only by this so-called clickbait. How many people are getting to into their site because they can see okay that's how they generate the biggest amount of traffic. But then what is really important is diverting the traffic mm -hmm. to the things uh, the, that really quality content. Mm -hmm. And then and then so just to, to to get back to to one of the first things you were talking about today. Um, so one of the very first slides you had pointed out that uh, there seemed to be some sort of identity crisis 
going on in that um, the entertainment orchestra, it could do popular, it mm. could do classical, and that what it seemed that the the Danish radio was um, was arguing was that okay we need clearer style profiles here we need an orchestra that's classical we need an orchestra that's popular we need and, and this one nobody really knows what it is if it can do both things wasn't that kind of the yes it's, but, it's a, and, and and but but what what puzzles me here is this is just to to link the latch on to your uh, last point isn't there a sense in which the uh, an, an orchestra like the entertainment orchestra could get people in maybe by playing a more accessible music and then they're sitting in the audience and then hit them with the Mozart yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. and the, whatever and not the Mozart is inaccessible but if you've never heard it before then you might not uh, say oh yes I'm suddenly going to decide to go to a Mozart concert so uh, was there no thinking of that sort at all because that would seem to be much more in line with what you heard from uh, the CEO of the Huffington Post right yeah yeah I did not uh, find that in uh, what, I, uh, was what I was uh, reading, but that's very Because that's interesting. very interesting when yeah, you think yeah. about that point, yeah, because yeah, yeah. if, if uh, and I mean, to me, it seems that he's a man worth listening to, given the fact that, uh, and as, as an up-and-coming journalist, you know the crisis your mm -hmm. industry is in, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one of the, the happy, you know, pieces of happy news that one of the success stories is the Huffington Post while everybody else is either trying to figure out how are they going to survive or what are we doing here. Um, they yeah. seem to, to be clear on that. And it would seem that, that that line of argument would be much more supportive of the entertainment orchestra than of the uh, other sort of phenomena you were discussing. Yeah, but yeah, but I just um, I think it was a problem the idea about consumption. That's also actually in connection with that. I just had an interesting thought I think from information mm -hmm. because also what we learn a lot in journalism is this think a group thing. You know, there are these segments, and you know, this um, Henrik Dahl, uh, if your neighbor was a car, this book has been written with words. I mean, it has been effective. You know, then then you can see statistically that some people are you can like also play with the internet to find their interest and then make something that's really. You know, uh, you know where you're really targeting the, the interest that you can statistically see. But but the thing about consumption, I think I, I figured about it. And then I came to think of an interesting uh, in, information article, and there's this interesting quote about how uh, maybe we should not so much think about consumption of culture today, but more how we talk about it. Or this reads, um, then it, it says there are still, you know borders between like uh, what people use that, that the elite maybe uh, listens to more opera or whatever that you know there are differences it's, it claims them but then it says borders are still drawn but were the borders earlier only was drawn by the content of our cultural consumption they are today much more defined by our ability to interpret our own cultural consumption with other words it's not so important anymore what we hear see read or taste it's much more important how you talk about mm -hmm. what you see mm -hmm. Here, read and taste, mm. and I also think that's kind of the key to, I mean, how to you know the classical music you should like brand it if you want that. That that I actually think it's, it's much more about you, you, yeah, how you get people to talk about it. You can understand it in, in different ways, and, and you know, if, I'm sure there's some potential out there also to find new listeners and, and viewers if you just you know try to think this way maybe, and uh, also as you told about the. Uh, I mean now, now also there are also this handling on all these TV programs, uh, uh, talent program. Also, what we talk about is uh, very sort of superficial stuff. Maybe there'll be like a, you know, reaction against that where people want sort of authenticity. Mm. Maybe authenticity. that should like that's, that should be the headline. <laughs> and very interesting that you would. Uh, that, that's a nice note for us to end on the whole question of authenticity because, as you know. Uh, most of this uh, series, this spring term, has uh, been about uh, metal music, mm. where authenticity is the watchword. So mm. that's a very good way. Okay. That's a very good way to sort of 
end this uh, <laughs> seminar and prepare for the one which we're having next week, which will also be about metal. But before we go, Jens Jakob, mm -hmm. uh, we should get those two uh, YouTube links out there. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make any difference if it takes a little time, because Johnny can always uh, edit the, uh, the search process out if it, if it should take some time. So. Um, W would you like to put them up there because then people will know they're looking at the right um, YouTube clips if they'd like to c compare the yes. performance of the uh, entertainment orchestra and the uh, symphony orchestra. When the clip get, gets on YouTube, he can write it in the comment box too. Right. Um, yeah. Then you can. Exactly. Okay. <coughs> And then hopefully people who see this will also feel inspired to start writing comments because that's the whole idea about this is, uh, of this is that we can have some sort of ongoing uh, discussion. But I'm curious now too. I'd like to see these, mm -hmm. these two. Yeah. The first. Oh. Ah. Okay. There's actually even two of them. That's so I added for them. It's, yeah, you can even see, uh, it's trying to start here, but, but you can even see the playing time, it's like seven minutes. Could you, you could put it on the screen and we could Yeah, see. okay. But, you know, it's kind of interesting as we sit in the end of the discussion because, you know, I remember this as just dominating so much of uh, the press and so much air time, and you know, nobody's talking about it at all oh. anymore, and it's, it's, well, it's only been six months. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little symptomatic, isn't it, of the, of the way culture morphs. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, it's going to yeah, why don't we, uh, okay, Depending on how we use this, let's we'll just put this here. Yeah. Yeah. We just, okay. Maybe we cannot take it. Should we clip in? No, uh, you're right. We'll see. Okay. Oh, yeah, I forgot he said no. Hmm? Well, you've been to the other side. Yeah. But I think it'd be fun for those of us who are left here now to, to see the difference before we go. Yeah. Sure. I just find the third moment. Ah, must be here. Okay, and then I'll find it with the other as well. I think it actually. Yeah. Okay. So first we will hear the clip with. Uh, the Danish, uh, the symphonic orchestra of the North Radio. Okay. That's like the, the big. What's the first one on here? Oh. Oh, that's the wrong one. I just have to find it. That's the symphonic of 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 the Thank you. 